I started reading the Bible, but I just got lost in all the genealogy. You know, who begot who. Who was Melchizedek? Where did he come from? The book of Revelation just scares me. Does anybody really understand all those symbols? Who are the judges? Like, do they really matter? I've never understood which book came first. Is there a way to read the Bible so it makes sense? We want to welcome you once again to our Father's Plan. I'm Jeff Cavins along with Dr. Scott Hahn. It's good to have you again. Good to be here. And we are excited about the Bible, and that's what we're studying here on Our Father's Plan. We're going through salvation history, and we're looking at what God's plan is for our life, for the life of the church, and we're glad that you could join us. And we hope that, that you're reading along with us as we read through the Bible chronologically. And uh, we hope that you're enjoying Dr. Hahn's talks as we delve deeper into some of the theological issues that need to be addressed as you read through the Bible. It's good to have you. What are we going to be talking about today? Well, I think you're going to be talking about the patriarchal period, and that's going to give us the panoramic view, the bird's eye view, whereas I'm going to be giving the worm's eye view. We're going to be crawling along snail pace through Genesis 2 and into Genesis 3, looking first at how God makes a covenant with creation, making the earth a kind of home, creating Adam to be a, uh, not only a son of God, but a royal priest. You know, uh, the Catechism talks about how all Christians share in Jesus Christ's royal priesthood as sons and daughters of God, and how every family is called to be a kind of domestic church. Well, that goes all the way back to Genesis 2 and 3, and that is how God also tested Adam. That is the temptation context. That is the way to really understand uh, how God tried Adam's faith. Is he going to be faithful? to his marriage covenant with God and with Eve under difficult circumstances. And that's what I hope to set the stage for in our time together. That's wonderful. You know that in coming back to the Catholic Church, I was a Protestant minister, you were a Protestant minister, we both came into the Catholic Church. The catechism played such a, a central role for me. And I remember, uh, as a Protestant pastor, getting a hold of the catechism and reading it, and it just spoke to me. In fact, I preached from it, and I mean, the people really enjoyed sure. hearing the word from the catechism. Can you just explain briefly the relationship between the Scripture and the catechism for our viewers? Because I, I know that they, they need to go hand in hand. You know, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger has written on many occasions that dogma is not something opposed to the Bible. In fact, dogma is the interpretation of Scripture. And in the Catholic Catechism, we have the doctrines or the dogmas of the church laid out in very clear form. I am convinced that the Catechism is essential for understanding the Bible, just as the Bible is essential for really getting the most out of the Catechism. They go hand in hand. You can't understand either one without the other. They're that integrally connected. Mm -hmm. You know what I suggest for our, our viewers? I suggest that when you're reading through the Scripture, you really, you obtain a copy of the New Catholic Catechism. It's absolutely tremendous. In fact, when you're reading through the Bible and you come upon Scriptures that don't make a lot of sense to you, I would recommend looking at the index of citations in the back, and you can find out what the, the church teaches about those particular Scriptures. Uh, so often people will get hung up as they read the Bible or they're fearful, uh, but I think that the catechism, like you said, it goes hand in hand, and the two of them are, uh, are going to bear an awful lot of fruit. How have you used the catechism? Well, I've used the catechism in many ways. In fact, when I teach scripture courses, I'll often do exactly what you say. I'll look up the passages in the particular places within the catechism and show how they illuminate otherwise obscure portions of scripture. And likewise, we'll look at the texts that the catechism cites and study them in context and discover that these aren't really being used as proof texts without any consideration of context. They're really taking the context into consideration. Well, we're looking forward to the study today through the patriarchal period and what you have to say. Join us. We're excited to have you on this great adventure, Our Father's Plan. We'll be back in just a moment. Oops. 
Welcome back to our Father's Plan. We are in our third program already here, and we're talking about uh, the Bible. We're talking about reading through the Bible in such a way that it makes sense. As I said earlier, many of us have tried to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and oftentimes it just doesn't make any sense. So what we're attempting to do on our Father's Plan on this particular program is help you read the Bible so that it makes sense. And what I'll be doing is walking you through salvation history. Today we're on our second period of salvation history, the period of the patriarchs. Last uh, program we talked about the history of the early world. And in the second half of our program, Dr. Scott Hahn will be exploring theological concepts that will give you a better grasp of God's plan for your life, for our Father's plan for your life as you read through the Bible. Uh, we have been using a mnemonic device, a memory device, to help us go through the Bible. This is a little bead set that you can call in or write to EWTN to find out how you can obtain a particular set for yourself. It's called the Bible Timeline Band. Today we are on our second bead, and that is the patriarchal period, and that is the burgundy bead. And the burgundy bead means God's blood covenant with Abraham, and that's how we remember the second period, the patriarchs. The period of the patriarchs covers, is covered in the book of Genesis from chapter 12 through 50. Our first period, the history of the early world, was chapters 1 through 11. Today we'll be covering Genesis 12 through 50. This is an exciting portion of Bible history. This is sort of where everything explodes, and we are introduced to the patriarchs. What do we mean by the patriarchs? When we talk about the patriarchs in Genesis 12 through 50, we're talking principally about four characters, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Those are the four patriarchs. By patriarchs, we mean that they are the leaders of God's people. They're the male firstborn. They're the leaders of God's people. We'll be looking at their lives today. As Dr. Hahn has shared with you, covenants are very, very important in understanding salvation history. And a covenant differs from a contract. A covenant, as Dr. Hahn said, is a sacred kinship bond. Now, as we travel throughout salvation history, we're going to focus on the seed from Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman who is eventually going to crush the head of the serpent. Well, as we focus in on the seed, what happens to all of the other people? Well, those people are included in God's plan. You see that acorn that began in the first 11 chapters of Genesis keeps in mind all the nations of the, of the world. You see, our Father's plan includes all the people. It's up to you and I to be a witness today of our Father's plan and go out and spread the good news and tell people about Jesus Christ and what He has done in our, in our lives. Well, all throughout the Bible, the blessing is very, very important. We saw in the first period, the history of the early world, how the blessing is passed on through the firstborn male. And now we come to a very interesting point in salvation history. For the history of the early world ended in what really looked like gloom, the Tower of Babel, man continuing to rebel against God. But God had a plan, and that plan involved a man by the name of Abram. And we pick up in Genesis chapter 12. Abram was a, from a man from the uh, place called Ur of the Chaldees. Ur is where modern-day Iraq is. He left Ur, and he traveled northwest, uh, just north of Canaan, about 600 miles. And then he planted down his family at a place called Haran. From Haran, Abram traveled 400 miles south down into the land of Canaan. This land of Canaan is only 50 miles wide, about 150 miles uh, long. It's the playing board where a good percentage of the biblical drama takes place on. So it's important to know some geography. We won't be covering geography in this particular program, but I would encourage you to buy an atlas and become familiar with the land of the Bible. For this drama takes place on this playing board, and the playing board is important to get to know. He was 75 years old when he left Haran, and God spoke to him in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and I'd like to read that to you because this is very, very important. God is going to give Abram three very significant promises. Now, these promises are going to act as a blueprint for the rest of salvation history. And so, as you're reading through the Bible, these early portions of Genesis are crucial 
to understand the rest of the story. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, let me read, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, Ur of the Chaldees, and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And then he says to Abraham three significant things, three promises. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. So God makes Abram three promises. Those promises involve land, a royal dynasty, and third, a worldwide blessing. Now, Abram came down into the land of Canaan with his nephew Lot. And they uh, got into some squabbles among their people. And Lot chose some land called Sodom and Gomorrah, some choice land. Well, Lot found himself in trouble. And he was in trouble with a king by the name of Chedorle Omar and uh, several other kings. And he was taken captive. Abram, watching out for Lot, went and rescued Lot. In coming back to the city called Salem, Abram met the uh, king of Salem by the name of Melchizedek. And this is really important in reading through the Bible. This takes place in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. I can't stress to you how important this is because this event where Abram meets Melchizedek this is so crucial because it links the history of the early world with the patriarchal period. You see, scholars tell us that Melchizedek was Shem. You remember who Shem was from our last program. If you look on our diagram here, our, our chart, our timeline, you'll see that Shem is the firstborn of Noah. He is the man from the history of the early world period that carries the blessing. And Shem, Melchizedek, will bless Abram. And so we have this connection between the history of the early world and the patriarchal period. That's important as far as continuity when it comes to reading the Bible. You may say, well, how do you know that, that Shem is Melchizedek? Well, I would just uh, uh, let you know that many of the Targums speak of this. And the Targums are the Aramaic translations of the Old Testament. And many uh, Jewish scholars and other scholars would concur. And Dr. Hahn speaks about this in several of his, his tapes. Well, we come to the three promises that God gave Abram. These three promises of land, a royal dynasty, and worldwide blessing are, if you will, upgraded to covenants. And this is really important to get a hold of. The first covenant that God makes with Abram concerns land, and that's in chapter 15 of Genesis. It's the first of the three promises that Abraham's descendants will inherit land and become a nation. That's the first. And this is affiliated or fulfilled in the Mosaic Covenant. Let me show you on our timeline. We have here Abram, and God makes a covenant with Abram. As I said, it's really three covenants. It's really a progression of three covenants. And this covenant with Abram, the first, in Genesis chapter 15, speaks of land. And this is fulfilled with Moses. We have Moses here much later on in Israel and Egypt period, which we're going to be looking at in our next program. Abram, the name, means exalted father. And his name was changed eventually to a father of a multitude. Well, this takes place during the second covenant with Abram. We have the first covenant dealing with land in chapter 15. The second covenant where we upgrade the promissory statement in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, takes place in Genesis 17. We're speaking of the second covenant now. And it speaks about making Abram's name great. It speaks of a future royal dynasty. Land, number one, a future royal dynasty, number two. As I said, this promise is upgraded by the covenant of circumcision in Genesis 17, verses 1 through 19. And it finds its fulfillment later on in David. And you look on my timeline here on the wall, we see King David up here in the United Kingdom period. In the United Kingdom period. <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 
18 and verse 19. God says, For I have chosen him in order that he may command his children. Speaking of Abram. This is one of the reasons I believe that God chose Abram, because he knew that Abram would be a man that would teach his children. That's very important. He would command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord, and by doing righteousness and justice, in order that the Lord may bring upon Abram what he has spoken about him. Now, between this second and third covenant, we have a couple of events. We have the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis chapter 18. And then we have the birth of Isaac in chapter 21. This brings us to our third covenant. In Genesis chapter 12 and 1 through 3, remember we have three promises, land, royal dynasty, worldwide blessing, that are upgraded by covenants. The third, the worldwide blessing, is upgraded by the covenant that takes place in Genesis chapter 22. This is called the Akedah. And this is the point where God calls on Abram to sacrifice his firstborn son, Isaac. The third of the three promises, worldwide blessing through Abram's seed, is upgraded at this point. And it finds its fulfillment in the new covenant with Jesus. Now, it is in this third covenant that God swears an oath that he will be responsible for the worldwide blessing. That means that God will be responsible for the curses as well. Now, after these three covenants, which are very important, I can't stress them enough, that if you're going to understand salvation history, you're going to understand the progression of events throughout the Bible, it is critical, it's crucial that you understand that here with Abram, there are three promises upgraded to three covenants, by three covenants, and those covenants correspond to the first one, Moses, Genesis 15 to Moses, Genesis uh, 17 to uh, David, and Genesis 22 to Jesus in the New Covenant. And so it gives you your structure, it gives you sort of the framework on which to understand the events that will be taking place in the future. Well, after Isaac, and by the way, the Scripture doesn't have a lot to say about, about Isaac, we have Jacob, the third patriarch. Jacob was the uh, son of Isaac, and he had a brother by the name of Esau, and Esau was actually the firstborn. But by God's providence, Esau, or Jacob, obtains the uh, blessing from Isaac. And then uh, he ends up having to leave as a result of that. You see that Esau is very upset that he has given up the, uh, the blessing. And so Jacob takes off, and where does he go? Back up north, 400 miles to Haran, run away from Esau. And it's while he's up in Haran that he meets his beautiful wife, Rachel. But his uh, uh, uncle Laban uh, tricks him into taking Leah as his first wife. And uh, the story goes that he has to work a number of years and he ends up with Rachel. Well, as a result of his relationship with Rachel, Leah, Bilha and Zilpa, handmaids of these two women, we have the 12 sons of Jacob, or the 12 sons of Israel. You see, Jacob's name was changed. He wrestled with God in Genesis chapter 32, and his name was changed from supplanter, one who beguiles or fools, to one who wrestles with God or one who strives with God. So his name was changed to Israel. So when you're reading the Bible and you come across the name Israel, know that it, it comes from Jacob. And when we talk about the, the 12 tribes of Israel, they are the 12 children or the 12 male children of Jacob, whose name is now Israel. Well, the narrative focuses on one particular son by the name of Joseph. Now, the bloodline of Jesus will follow the tribe of Judah, which we'll look at later. But in this patriarchal period, the narrative focuses on Joseph. Who's Joseph? Joseph is the firstborn of Rachel. And so he's, he's kind of a favorite of, of Jacob's. And the other boys know it. In fact, Joseph has a very special coat that he is wearing, a very colored coat, which signifies his place and of honor and authority in the family. And the brothers don't like this. 
Well, Joseph has a couple of dreams, and in these dreams, he dreams about seven sheaves bowing down to his, or in verse, uh, uh, these many sheaves, rather, not seven, but many sheaves bowing down to his. He also has a dream of the sun and the moon and 11 stars bowing down to him. And his brothers get a hold of this, and of course, they're not very pleased. And one day, Jacob sends Joseph to Shechem to look after his brothers. And they, his brothers get a hold of him, and they get this idea that they're going to kill him. And they finally say, no, we're not going to kill him. Let's just sell him into slavery. And so they sold him to a Midianite group for 20 shekels of silver. And that's how Joseph winds up in Egypt. But you know, in God's providence, this is the beautiful thing about reading the Bible. God has a plan. That's the, the name of this series, Our Father's Plan. He has a plan for your life. And when your life looks like everything is falling apart, Start reading the Bible. I mean, you will be assured that God is watching over you and that he has a plan. Look at Joseph. Joseph ends up in Egypt, and he ends up in a man's house by the name of Potiphar. And he is uh, tricked by Potiphar's wife, accused of rape, finds himself in prison. But because of his relationship with the Lord, he is a righteous man. He will not sin against the Lord. He finds himself as second in command of all of Egypt. It's related to the dreams that he interpreted for Pharaoh. You see, Pharaoh had a dream that there was going to be seven years of richness and fatness, followed by seven lean years. And Joseph would be put in charge, second in charge of Egypt, to divvy out the goods. Well, there was a famine in the land, and so Jacob and his 11 remaining brothers up north, they had to come down south to get food. And who do they run into? They run into Joseph. And so Joseph's brothers come in contact with him, and as uh, they are sent for food, as I said, Joseph gives them the grain, and then he accused the ten of being spies. See, ten of the brothers came down to receive food. Young Benjamin is still at home. And so Joseph said, we're going to hold Simeon as hostage and you come bring Benjamin back. Well, this caused a lot of problems in the family. The long and short of it is that God used Joseph to preserve Israel during difficult times. And I'm just reading from Genesis 45, verses 5 through 7. This is beautiful. This was Joseph's response to his brothers. You see, his brothers were afraid that Joseph was going to kill them for what they did to him earlier. But listen to the heart of this man of God who recognized that his father had a plan for his life. And you know, it really doesn't matter what men do to us as long as we follow the Lord, as long as we, we are intent on doing his will. Listen to this. And now, he says to his brothers, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. What a beautiful story. And so we end our patriarchal age in Egypt. You know, it's interesting. In, uh, back in Genesis uh, chapter 15, in verse 13, God said something to Abraham about land. You're going to have this land of Canaan, but your ancestors are going to be in a foreign land for 400 years in slavery. And so Abram really never enjoyed those promises. Our next period of history, as you look on my timeline here, the Israel and Egypt, those are the 400 years that the ancestors are going to be in slavery. That's where we're going to beat Moses. That's where we're going to go through the Exodus. But just in review, this patriarchal period, four patriarchs. We start with one man by the name of Abram. God makes three promises to him, upgraded three covenants that will be fully realized later on in salvation history. At the end of this period, we find ourselves down in Egypt for 400 years. Once again, I encourage you, get into the Bible. For this period of the patriarchs, read Genesis chapter 12 through 50. And as you're reading, be aware of God's plan for his people. We're going to return in just a moment, and Dr. Scott Hahn is going to share some more wonderful insights from the scripture. We'll be right back. <music> 
This is our third time together to look at Scripture to understand our Father's plan. The first time we laid the foundation, first by looking at God as Father, second by looking at the gift of salvation as being nothing less than Christ's own divine Sonship given to us in the Spirit. Third, we saw how the covenant is the overarching principle of Scripture and of all salvation history. And third, we saw the culmination of history being the Catholic Church as the family of God. Last time we focused primarily upon Genesis 1 in order to draw out its contextual meaning. Now I emphasize the contextual meaning because we want to understand the meaning of Scripture always in its original context. Too often people approach Genesis 1 and try to force it to answer modern questions before they've bothered to really answer this question, what did the original writer have in mind and what would the original readers have seen? How would they have understood the narrative? Looking last time at the contextual meaning of Genesis 1, the six days of creation, we saw this situation describing the earth at the very beginning, that the earth was without form and void, tahu wabahu. That is, it didn't have form and it didn't have any inhabitants. So we considered how Genesis 1 goes on to describe the creation process in six days in two series of three days. So in the first three days, you have God resolving the problem of formlessness as he creates day and night, as he created the sky and the sea, as he created the land and vegetation. So form now exists on earth. We have time, we have space, and we have life. And then in a parallel pattern, days four, five, and six correspond to days one, two, and three because God creates the rulers to rule over those three realms. First, we have the sun, moon, and stars to rule over the day and the night. We have, secondly, on day number five, the birds and the fish to fill and to subdue the sky and the sea. And then on the sixth day, we have beasts being made along with man in order to populate the earth and to eat the vegetation. So we saw the contextual meaning there in Genesis 1, showing how God brings design in order to bear upon the earth, in order for it to become our habitation. And in particular, we focused upon the significance of man being made by God in the image and likeness of God. And even the language of Genesis 1.26 suggests something almost family-like. Let us make Man after our image, God says. St. Irenaeus, already in the second century, pointed to how we have sort of a foreshadowing of the Trinity already in the opening chapter of Genesis. So that this eternal family, which God is, creates man in his own image and likeness. He creates man in a family way. He creates man, male and female. He creates them in the primordial state of the marriage covenant. So there we see God commissioning man to exercise dominion over all of the earth. Dominion is a royal term that points to man's task as king. He is to exercise a kingly rule over over the uh, earth, imaging God, who is not only father, but also the Lord and king of creation. Now, this time, I'd like to focus more upon Genesis chapters 2 and 3 and consider not the first six days and how God formed the earth, but consider the seventh day as it's described in the opening of chapter 2. We're also going to go on and consider the way in which marriage is described at the end of chapter 2 and the temptation account in chapter 3 and how and perhaps even why Adam fell. Let's take a look first of all there in Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work which he had done. Now how does God finish this work? Does he go on to do something more? He finishes his work by resting. He finished his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Now why does God rest? Is God worn out? Is God exhausted? Obviously not. To ask the question in those terms is practically to answer it. Well then, why does God rest on the seventh day? 
It isn't because he needs the rest. It's because he knows that we will need it. And he is becoming our father. We are becoming his children, and we will thus imitate him. And he's establishing a pattern in creation that will enable us to live and prosper and become like him. So on the seventh day, God finished his work, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. And so God blessed the seventh day. Remember now, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, as our Lord said. So we have to understand that God's purpose in resting and blessing the seventh day is not because he needed it, but because we needed it. And so it goes on. God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on, on it God rested from all his works which he had done in creation. Two key words then, God's blessing and God's hallowing, that is, God's sanctifying. This is the first time the word is used there. The Hebrew notion of hallowing or sanctify is very important. It's where we get the notion of holiness to be set apart. So God sets the seventh day apart. Why is it? Because I am convinced God uses the seventh day to reveal to man his ultimate destiny. You see, man was made on the sixth day along with all of the beasts. But unlike the beasts, man was made for the seventh day. We work like the animals. We actually have areas of dominion like the lions and tigers and bears and all the other animals do in the, in the earth. But unlike those animals, we have been created with a capacity that is divine. We are able to pray to God. We are able to love God as children love their father. And so the sixth day is not enough for us. God knows that ultimately we are not made for work, but for worship. We are not made just simply to labor. We are not simply made for kingly dominion. We are not simply made for the earth. We are made for heaven. And that's the theological meaning of the seventh day. Throughout the Old Testament, the Sabbath is the sign of the covenant. You see this especially in the 20th chapter of Ezekiel. The sign of God's covenant with creation is the Sabbath. Now, why is that? What is the connection between seventh day and the Sabbath and the covenant? Well, we can't answer that question comprehensively, but I would like to suggest a few ways to address the question. First of all, by looking in Genesis 21 briefly. In Genesis 21, we see another covenant-making episode, another episode involving the number seven also. In Genesis 21, Abraham and Abimelech make a covenant. We read about how they make it in verse 31. Therefore, that place was called Be'er Sheva, because there both of them swore an oath, so they made a covenant in Be'er Sheva. Now, how did Abraham and Abimelech make this covenant? Quite simply, by Abraham presenting seven ewe lambs to Abimelech. And we read about this exchange in verse 29, and Abimelech said to Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs? He said, these seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand that you may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore, that place was called Be'er Sheva. Now, if you look in the footnotes of most of your Bibles, you'll find that Be'er Sheva literally means well of the seven, the seven ewe lambs, or well of the oath. You see, the Hebrew word Sheva means seven, but it's also the same word for swearing on covenant oath. So, what's so astonishing to me about Genesis 21 is not what's asserted in these few verses about the connection between covenant oath, and seven, but what's assumed by the original writer and what he assumes his original readers must have understood. He assumes that you would pick up this connection between covenant making, oath swearing, and the number seven. And so if you go back into Genesis 1 and 2 and ask yourself the question, why does a God who doesn't wear out, why does this God rest on the seventh day? Why does he then bless the seventh day? And why does he sanctify it, consecrate it? I would suggest to you the meaning there is what occurred to many of the ancient Jewish readers, as you find, for instance, in Jubilees 36 or 1 Enoch 69, two famous intertestamental Jewish books that many Jews were reading back in the first century and perhaps even before.
And the meaning is simple, that when God creates in six days and binds himself to creation on the seventh day, when he rests the seventh day, he is swearing an oath. He is binding himself by covenant to his creation. He is transforming a creator-creature relation into a sort of covenant family one. So that a covenant is implicitly present now in creation by virtue of the seventh day. Now another text that might be helpful to study in this regard would be found in Exodus. We don't have the time to look at it closely, but in Exodus chapters 35 through 40, we read about the erection of the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle was God's dwelling place in Israel. It was the sacred tent where God's own dwelling was signified. What's interesting is that in Exodus 35 to 40, God stipulates that the, the tabernacle was to be erected in six days. Now it could have been thrown up probably in a few hours in just one day, but God specifies it is to be done in six days. And in Genesis 1, we find the, the phrase, and God said, used 10 times. In Exodus, 20, in Exodus 35 to 40, scholars point out how you also have God speaking exactly 10 times. And at the end of this episode in Exodus 35 to 40, we have the seventh day being the day when God consecrates Aaron as high priest. So the tabernacle was built in six days, and the high priest was consecrated and called unto priestly service on the seventh day. That is why many scholars, Jewish, Catholic, and Protestant interpreters, see that the meaning, the theological significance of the seventh day in Genesis 2 points to Adam not simply being a king as he was on the sixth day, given dominion, but being a royal high priest called to share God's Sabbath rest, called to enter into God's holiness. And so a covenant is now present between God and his creation, the mediator of which is Adam. He is God's firstborn son in the human family. He is therefore both king and high priest. This particular descriptive account, then, implies a few practical conclusions. First of all, God is not simply creator. By virtue of the covenant, our creator has, been, has become our father. Secondly, by establishing a covenant with the creation, the creation is not just one vast cosmos any longer. It has become God's own sacred house his home, a home in which we are to live with him as children. And so, the third point would be, by virtue of God uh, making a covenant with us, we're not just creatures anymore. We are God's sons and God's daughters. We are now forming God's covenant family. Therefore, the language used in Genesis 1 describing God is, it uses the word El or Elohim to describe God. The Hebrew word Elohim means God in the generic sense of the divine being, the deity. But in Genesis 2, we hear God spoken of as Yahweh Elohim. You see, Yahweh is God's covenant name, but you only call Elohim Yahweh if you share a covenant family bond with him. And so in Genesis 2, having bound himself to us by covenant, God is our father, we are his children, and the earth is our home, a royal temple, a royal palace in which God calls us to holy service. Now when you look at Adam's status in Genesis 2, you see a remarkable privilege that God grants to us. God is calling Adam to priestly service, but priestly service always involves a test. God the Father is about to test his son. He is going to administer a test by means of what scholars call the trial by ordeal. Adam is going to be tried and tested by his father to see if his faith and love are real and to purify that faith, that hope, and love. Now, moving along then in Genesis 2, I'd like to look at just a few textual clues 
that the writer gives us to understand how God sets up this trial by ordeal in which he tests his firstborn son Adam as a royal high priest in this temple. And incidentally, I should just mention something. There's a scholar at Oxford by the name of Gordon Wenham who's done some remarkable research on the language used in Genesis 2. And what he has found really fits everything we have said thus far. In Genesis 1, we have a kind of temple being created, a cosmic temple, just as the Later, later on, the ancient Jews understood the temple that Solomon built was the world in miniature. The temple was a microcosmos, so the cosmos is described in Genesis as a macro temple in which God's glory is manifest. And then Wenham points out that in Genesis 2, the words, the Hebrew terminology found in Genesis 2 is found later on in the book of Exodus and Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, to describe, guess what? The sanctuary where the high priest performed his holiest duties. We can't get into all the technical vocabulary, but when improves, I think very convincingly, that Genesis 1 describes the earth as a temple, and Genesis 2 describes the Garden of Eden as the Holy of Holies, as the sanctuary in which God calls Adam as high priest to serve him faithfully in love. Now, how does he do it? Well, you know the story. We won't go through all the details. I just want to highlight a few of the textual clues, I think, that set up an interpretation of the narrative of the, uh, the temptation and fall. First of all, we read in verse 9, And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, of course, we know that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the forbidden fruit. The tree of life is that which Adam could eat to live forever. Now, wait a second. Isn't Adam supposed to be immortal already in his created state? Why would there be any need for a tree of life? If somebody is immortal, why would he need a life insurance policy? It almost seems superfluous, like something unneeded. But I think the narrator is setting us up to understand that the tree of life may well become necessary. Moving on, we see another textual clue that sets this up. In verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till the garden and to keep it. Now, the word for till is to cultivate, but the word to keep is unique. The Hebrew word is shamar, which literally means to guard it. Later on, it's used to describe the priest's duties in guarding the sanctuary. Now, if Adam is being commanded to guard the garden, what does that imply? It implies that there is something that it needs to be guarded from. But what? The narrator doesn't tell us. He's setting us up for the next chapter. And it goes on to describe the prohibition you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, dying you shall die. That's the literal rendering of the Hebrew. In the day that you eat of it, you shall die. And then verse 18, we find a remarkable statement. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Now up until now, everything has been good. God saw what he had made, and it was good. In fact, at the end of the creation week, God saw everything that he had made, and it was very good. But now the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. So Genesis 2 describes how God goes about creating the marriage covenant in which the man and woman will image God, the Blessed Trinity. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Then the narrator adds, but for the man, there was not found a helper fit for him. Well, obviously, did God expect Adam to find from among the animals a suitable helpmate? No. Obviously, that was not God's expectation. So why did God bring all the animals to Adam to name them after he had seen that it wasn't good that he was alone. I would suggest, once again, the narrator wants us to dig a little deeper and to see that God is showing Adam 
that you're more than an animal. You are more than an earthbound creature. You are called to a higher and holier destiny. And so living an animal-like existence, just following the base appetites of your body and flesh, this is not where you'll find fulfillment and happiness. So for the man there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept took one of the ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And then, of course, he takes from this rib and makes the woman. And he brings the woman to the man. And I like verse 23. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, Isha, because she was taken out of man, Ish. Adam recognizes the equality, the solidarity, the covenant likeness between himself and his bride, God's daughter. And so now we hear the command that the father-in-law of Adam gives. Therefore a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, again, we can't possibly do justice to these, to these passages. But I would suggest to you that this text gives us the key to bringing our culture back to Christ. You see, in marriage, sexuality is holy. And this is the lie. This is what I should say, this is what overcomes the lie in our society today. Our society treats human sexuality as though it's just simply something good. You'll hear certain people say, oh, sex is good. No, sex is not good. What do you mean sex isn't good? Somebody might say, no, sex is great. No, that's a lie too. What do you mean it's a lie? How can you say that? Sex is good? No, Campbell's soup. Campbell's soup is good, mm-mm good. You might say, well, well, then sex is great the way God has made it. No, sex is not merely great. Frosted flakes, they're great. But sexuality is much more than just great. You see, God created human sexuality to be sacred, to be holy. Only in covenant is human sexuality to be expressed in a marital form. And when you take something that is holy and sacred and treat it as though it's simply good or even great, that is what it means to desecrate it. Imagine you're there in the church and you see somebody walk up to the tabernacle, open up the door and take out a host, and they begin to consume the Holy Eucharist. And you're surprised, you're, you're shocked, and you say, wait a second, that's the Holy Eucharist. And they say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to, to bother you. It's very good, thank you. You wouldn't be satisfied if they said it was good. Well, oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's great, wonderful recipe. That wouldn't be enough either because it's holy, and when you treat something that's holy as though it's simply good or even great, you profane it, you desecrate it. And so God has created the marriage covenant as this primordial state in which man is to live, man is to grow into obedience, and in which man will be tested. And we read, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, there's a word play in the Hebrew here, because the word for naked, erum, is almost exactly like the word used in the next verse. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. The word for subtle in Hebrew is arum. The two words sound almost the same, suggesting that the serpent entering the garden is entering for the purpose of exploiting the weakness symbolized by the couple's nakedness. Now, we don't have the time to get into this now, but I want to set the stage for our discussion next time, because in Genesis 3 and following, we find the narrative of Adam's temptation described in a way that can only be grasped in terms of the covenant trial by ordeal. Now, in the opening verse of chapter 3, we read, Now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. The Hebrew word for subtle sounds just like the Hebrew word for nakedness. Why does the narrator do this? I think most interpreters are right in saying that it implies that the serpent's strategy is to exploit the vulnerability symbolized 
by the nakedness of Adam and Eve. In other words, the Garden of Eden is a paradisical state in which this couple would find themselves in honeymoon bliss, all except for one thing. The serpent has entered. Now, wait a second. Why would God allow the serpent to enter in the first place? Think back to Genesis chapter 2, where God had given the command to Adam that you are not only to till and cultivate the garden, but you are also to shamar. You are to guard it. You are to keep it. Guard it from what, he must have wondered. Well, now he's about to discover what it's to be guarded from. This leads us to interpret the trial of Adam as an ordeal in which God the Father is going to test his son to see just how much he loves and how much he trusts. One other thing, too, that should be said about this particular verse. In chapter 3, verse 1, the word for serpent, Nahash, doesn't necessarily mean snake. If you look elsewhere in Isaiah, for instance, the same word is used to describe Leviathan, a great serpent dragon. And in fact, in Revelation 12, verse 9, the ancient serpent is described as a dragon. Now, we have no idea exactly what the narrator is depicting here, whether it's a little snake or a great dragon. But one thing we know, and that is the serpent is the devil. And the devil is intent upon murdering us spiritually is what he really wants, spiritual death. But maybe some other form of death he has in mind as well. In any case, the serpent is a symbol of evil, malice, temptation, and also a symbol of life-threatening force. The serpent is more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. Notice he speaks not to Adam, but to Eve. And he says, did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? He begins with a question. The devil always does. And the woman's thrown off balance and says, well, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of, which is in the midst of the garden. Uh, I'm sorry. We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. And now the serpent says, you shall not die. What? The serpent is contradicting the Lord. But wait a second. When they ate the fruit of the garden, when they ate that forbidden tree, did they die? Physically, no. But spiritually, yes. The narrator seems to be calling us to a deeper reading here. You will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now that's a lie, isn't it? Well, look, on, look later on and you'll see that in fact, God declares after they ate the forbidden fruit, behold, they have become like us, knowing good and evil. So the serpent, the devil, is an expert liar because he knows how to use truths to deceive. He knows how to confuse people, and that's what he's doing here. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband and he ate. Notice that she didn't have to go looking for him. No search was needed because he wasn't far off. He was right there. I would suggest to you something that is essential for interpreting this, and that is, why was Adam silent? What is the significance of Adam's silence? As husband, was he to be silent as his own wife was being interrogated by the serpent? I would suggest to you that here we find the clue to how Adam's fall began. Next time when we come back, we're going to focus upon this narrative, this trial by ordeal, this temptation, to see how the first Adam failed with regard to his wife and how that sets up the stage to appreciate Jesus Christ as a new Adam who lays his life down for his bride, who goes to a garden and then to a tree and is tested and tried in an ordeal situation in order to undo what Adam did and to do what Adam should have done. And that is to trust the Lord, to obey the Father, and to love with the laying down of his own life. See you next time. <laughs> Santa Dei